So Ninth and Tracy, that's the crossroads in Kansas City where the unity movement was born. That's where our co-founders, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, begin everything that, that blossomed out of the divine idea that they received. So there was spiritual education going on there. There was Sunday services. There were publications. There were tons of employees. There was a vegetarian restaurant that was one of the most popular anywhere around. And so people would come from a long way away just to have a meal at that vegetarian restaurant. They're still today on that property, because as many of you know, Unity Village was then born, which was um, a little bit further out in Kansas City. But still today, there's a church at Ninth and Tracy, the first one. And about five years ago, I took a group there. And we were on a tour, and we were coming up the steps to the second floor. And the floorboard creaked at about the second to the top step. And I just felt this benevolent, feminine, powerful presence. We were only steps away from Myrtle Fillmore's office, the place where she met with people one-on-one -on -one for prayer treatment. And it said, the stories are, that people would come in with crutches and canes and they'd leave without them. Myrtle Fillmore, our mother of unity, said, this is our method of prayer. You can remember it as ace. She said, acknowledging our oneness with God, claiming the ability that this gives, and expecting to have the things needed and conducive to our spiritual progress. That's affirmative prayer. Acknowledging, claiming, expecting. New Thought's approach to prayer, this idea of affirmative prayer, makes really the best use of our principles. It's really an obvious one in the co-creative principle, the one we talked about last week, because how do we co-create but through our thoughts and feelings? And so the next step is really to speak into being those thoughts and feelings, right? To begin to have those thoughts and feelings take shape in the form of words and then take shape in the form of visibility in our world. It's also our divine potential, that uh, number two, the idea of the divine within us. We access that, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that today as well. So whatever it is that we are seeing, imagining, desiring for our lives and our world, you know, things like love and connection and freedom and equality, you know, all those goodies, <laughs> that's all a part of what we bring forth through the power of prayer and meditation. So for health, for example, we might affirm, mighty currents of healing love are flowing through me now, and I am whole and well. And you might add, in my mind, in my spirit, in my, in my body, whatever it is that we are seeking that kind of, of healing, that kind of, as, as we would say in, in the old days and still sometimes say, prayer treatment, um, like Myrtle was offering. The fourth unity principle can be summed up like this. Through prayer and meditation, I connect with God to bring out the good in my life. It's that simple, really. So in short, if we take the two aspects of this principle, meditation, we, you've probably heard this shorthand before, meditation is like listening to the truth of spirit. It is listening, right? It's a listening process, a going within. And prayer is a speaking of that truth of spirit. Meditation might entail pausing our outdoor, our outer activities and just going within for some quiet time. And in that experience, we might experience peace, calm. We might give some rest and relaxation to our bodies, to our minds, to finally let the, the thinking and the, the constant activity of the mind slow down and move into that expansive space. So there's so much that happens when, when we do this. And, and so one of it might be one way, to, might be just this quiet listening, this going into silence. And another might be more active form of meditation where we, we actually witness or watch our, pay attention to our thoughts. I think of Eckhart Tolle, he says, watch your thoughts like a cat watching a mouse hole. <laughs> you know, just paying attention to what, what comes through, what, what arises, and feelings too, whatever it is that, 
becomes present, we become a witness to that. So it's sort of an active form of meditation where we become clearer about our thoughts and our emotions, what's going on in the sensations of our bodies. So Charles Fillmore, actually both Myrtle and Charles spent lots of time in meditation from what we hear, hours at a time, certainly how they healed physically their own bodies and, and really what began our movement. But Charles would often say he was going to go to headquarters because in all this babble, he said, with all these different ideas and theories and conversations and, and classes that they were going through, he said, in this babble, I'm just going to, if, if this God is who they say it is and I can have access directly, I'm just going to headquarters then. And so he would sit in the quiet to learn, to experience, to uncover what this was all about. He did it so frequently, and he was actually a pretty outgoing guy from the stories I hear. So he liked to be in a lot of social time and that kind of thing. And so they would have family gatherings. But all of a sudden, they called him Papa Charlie. Papa Charlie's eyes would be closed, and somebody would say, oh, Papa Charlie's in the silence again. And so they would continue their, you know, whatever they were doing, their activity all around him, and there he would sit in the silence. So this idea of prayer and meditation, I mean, why do it? I think it's worth looking at that for a moment, what we get out of it. Um, some of the, the benefits, I just mentioned peace and calm, the body, the, the, the quiet, the expansion, but there's so much more. You know, there's the development of a relationship with the divine so that life can become kind of a dance with the divine. So there's, there's a sense of um, tapping that innate guidance, our innate wisdom, and, and having guidance available to us to help us make really good decisions, um, to know which way to go and what to say. And you know some, some of that can become so second nature when we are practiced in, in this kind of prayer and meditation. Also, we can, you know, begin to feel that presence and, and, and in that feeling of the divine presence, there might be a sense of a lot of feelings that could come, a sense of reassurance, perhaps, a sense of, of being refilled or energized by that time. I know a lot of times our noon meditations, um, right now online, they seem to just have a, have a real depth to them. And I, I just feel really connected, actually, to those that we are meditating with. And, and I know a lot of times when we're in person here in a busy day and we all stop at noon here in the sanctuary, I feel a sense of, re, you know, a reboot, a sense of energizing from that time. So we do it for lots of reasons, to improve our well-being, for a sense of uplift. I mean, it just goes on and on, right? All the, all the ways that we might, the reasons why we might pray and meditate. So I really want to get to this because this is really the key. Why don't we? <laughs> if these are all the goodies and, we, and they're endless and I've only mentioned a few of them, why don't we? Why don't we have a regular practice of prayer and meditation? If, and if you do, is it, you know, it, is it working for you? I guess is another question, you know, to always take it to the next level for ourselves. And, and there is, on the spiritual journey, I think, always value in looking at where the blocks are. Because the truth is, we've got it all here, right? The, if the, truly, we know this, the divine is in us, and we have access through the divine intelligence of the universe, the, the essence of divine love that is available to us through the portal of our own hearts, the, the wisdom that we, that we have access to. So all of that is available to us, yet what really keeps us is, is the blocks, right? Whatever it is that blocks us. So it's worth looking at what, where the resistance is to prayer and meditation, why we don't practice. And there's a lot of reasons, but there's really kind of the big three that I'm going to name today that I think are generally the, the main reasons why most of us would, that most of us would give. One is there might just be disbelief. I don't really think it works. I don't think it's that effective. I haven't really noticed a difference in my life when I've done it. Another one might be that there's a sense of that we lack something, right? I don't have the know-how. I don't know how to do it right, or I don't have enough time. Or maybe there's just plain fear. So let's break those down for a minute. Let's first look at this idea of this disbelief that it doesn't work or it can't be effective. 
if you're one who believes that, that it, it, or doesn't believe that it could really work or make a difference in your life, you know, there's only one way to know, right? To, to do it, to just do it and see and give it a chance, not just a one-off time. This is a conversation I often have with my mom. I'll ask her to try something new for, say, arthritis pain. I just sent her some CBD oil and I said, Mom, the, the doctor said, take it, you know, three times a day for a week. Oh, yeah, I tried that. It didn't work. How many times did you try it? <laughs> you know? So it's that kind of thing. You know, give it a chance. Give it a chance to see if it might be effective for you. When I think about this idea of disbelief, I often think about that story in the Bible where the man comes to Jesus to heal his son, and he's at his wit's end. And you can, I can feel in that story just this deep love that he has for his son and this absolute desperation that he wants him to be healed. And so um, he asks Jesus to heal him, but you could tell he's questioning whether he can. And Jesus says, don't you believe I, you know, basically, don't you believe I can? And the man just cries out and he says, I believe, help my unbelief. And I, I feel like when I read that, I hear it like, it, like it's loud and it's, it's, a, it's a truly a cry, you know. And in that cry, there is sort of a mix of despair and hope. <laughs> you know, help my unbelief. There's a little hope there, right? I guess I, I feel that viscerally too myself because, I, you know, I feel like that's my prayer, you know, that, that we have we only touch, we only sort of surface scratch the divine potential that we have. And so I want the divine to help my unbelief so that the faith can be deeper and richer and the opening to that divine potential more full. If we fully tapped our divine potential, do you know how we could rock our lives and our community and our world? I mean, it is, I think it would be quite mind-blowing. And so if, if that becomes our prayer, I believe, help my unbelief, help the places where I, I come up short from understanding or, or fully having the faith to stand on. That's a prayer worth praying, I think. Spiritual practice helps us with our unbelief. It helps strengthen our faith. It helps us have these experiences of the divine that, that, that then we get it. We get how life flows differently when we practice versus when we don't. And the kinds of information and downloads and guidance that we might receive by taking that time apart. So maybe you've tried prayer and you say, you know, uh-uh, doesn't work. A common example would be, I prayed for somebody's healing and then they made their life transition instead. I could see on face value where that would be awfully disappointing and it would feel like we failed somehow, that our prayer wasn't right or the thing doesn't work at all. But it's deeper than that. It's always deeper than that, isn't it? Because we think healing has got to look a certain way. We think healing stops just with the physical body or if we're praying for, for mental health, uh, the mind. And so there's this sense of limitation often. Part of what opens when we open to the deeper realms that are accessible to us through practice is we recognize there's more going on here. A soul has a whole experience, right? And there's more than the eye can see. So who are we to say that healing looks exactly like this? You know, a, a, a broken bone healed, a, a, you know, a cold over, a person's long-term disease cured. Maybe it looks a different way on another level. Peggy Bassett was a really influential religious science minister. She was the founder of the Holmes, in, the school, Holmes School of Ministry. She also had a church uh, and was the founder of that in Huntington Beach. At the height of her ministry, she contracted Lou Gehrig's disease, and eventually it took her physical life in 1995. But she said this really intriguing thing about prayer and healing and the power that is, is at work. She says that we tend to think that the purpose of prayer is to terminate sickness. But we forget that the purpose of sickness may be to initiate prayer. 
or to deepen our relationship with the divine. She turns the whole thing on its head, right? And we begin to see, ah, this is a part of the dance. The practice is a part of the relationship. It all unfolds, and we may not see the whole revelation, but we're in it, and we're experiencing it, and we're growing and evolving all the while. So maybe your, your place of disbelief might be that we, you don't believe, or you somehow believe, that you lack the know-how, or that you lack time, that there is a sense of, of lack that is, is in the resistance of the practice. It's really common, right, to think we lack time. I don't have enough time to sit and meditate. I don't have enough time in my day because I have such a a long to-do list. Well, we've all had this long pause of the pandemic that has opened up more space for people. People that don't commute, for example, maybe have more time and space in their day, in their work day. And so time is an interesting concept, isn't it? It's a very chronos time, a very man-made concept. It doesn't really exist in spirit. Chronos time is calendars and clocks, right? It's just, it's sort of how we function in a physical society. But what we're really after is more what the Greeks would call kairos time. Kairos time is spiritual time. It's a funny thing when we enter into meditation in that kairos kind of expansive time I find, and I've heard other people say this too, that chronos time flows really easily and it seems like we do have more chronos time when we enter into this kairos type of time in prayer and meditation. I can't exactly explain it except to say that we've sort of, we've shifted into the divine flow and so things just flow in a different kind of way and we don't feel enslaved by the calendar and the clock so much. So this I can attest in terms of know-how, if that's the place where you think you lack, is that there's no right way to pray except from the heart. We talk about affirmative prayer because it aligns really well with our principles. But if you haven't yet learned it, don't let that keep you from praying. It's just about speaking our truth from our hearts or thinking even our truths. So, and there's lots of resources to learn, right? There's tons of books, there's tons of apps, there's all kinds of things available, that classes, retreats, all kinds of ways that we can enhance our knowledge, our know-how, our how-to, if you will. Or we could simply close our eyes and ask the divine, teach me to pray. Seems like that's what Sue K. Riley is inviting us into, this beautiful song. Let's take a look. Good morning. I'd like to do a song that I wrote with my friend Fred Bogart called Teach Me to Pray. Teach me, teach me to pray. My heart is open wide. My care are swept away, O oh Spirit, teach me to pray, teach me to live in grace, wash my grief away.
Lift me up in the light In your holy way Knowing this time is right Oh Spirit, teach me to pray To pray, oh Spirit Teach me to pray Teach me to Well, it's a beautiful song, and it's a beautiful thing, isn't it, to pray and to meditate, and yet we still resist. Some people fear what they might experience when they go into the inner world. Perhaps in this unknown place, it's, well, it could be a little scary. We might experience unpleasant visions, for example, or insights or sensations or perhaps we'll become attuned to pain in the body or pain in the heart, maybe feeling some ill feelings or remembering some things we'd rather not remember. All of those reasons can keep us pushing away from just closing our eyes and sitting in the quiet. I had a friend like that who would resist meditating because she said every time she did, she would cry because she would, become, she would come in contact with the pain around her divorce. And yet when we would sit, when she would come to church services and during the meditation time, she would sit there and cry. And then afterwards she would tell me, oh, that was so, you know, it was such a gift really to be able to let myself go there and to release like that. And so she would have this, this experience of just a lightness of being and, and a healing that would take place there. So if we are willing then to open ourselves and to know that on the other side of the rawness of emotion are those kinds of breakthroughs, those kinds of gifts, that kind of lightness of being and healing can take place. So all that time we spend sort of pushing away or bottling up <laughs> doesn't really serve us in any way. So... I understand why sometimes it's hard for us to take that first step and maybe taking it in community is the place to go. So again, I want to bring forward our noon meditation right now is a good time to gather with us in meditation as of course is Sunday services. So sometimes we resist practicing because we're afraid that we're going to be guided to do something that we don't feel ready to do. And then we're going to have this conundrum <laughs> Spirit showed me to do this, and I don't feel like it's something I'm ready to do, or maybe I think I don't want to do it. But cer it's certainly possible that will come. What I've discovered is that if I'm guided to do something, then I am ready to do it. I may not think I'm ready to do it, but I am ready to do it. Otherwise, I wouldn't receive the guidance. And this is probably the most important thing to remember in this regard is that we're never alone, that God is always with us, that we have all the resources we need to take the next step and the next step and the next. It's another thing we tend to think of like the whole ballywick or the end of whatever it is that we're moving toward, you know, a big move or a change in jobs or a change in relationships, but it's just that initial first step and then another and then another. Um, and if we can kind of break it down into that, then it becomes a little bit easier to move toward guidance that feels perhaps a little scary. Prayer and meditation really ultimately can be an act of bravery. <laughs> we don't often think of it in those terms, but really it is because, you know, we're moving into a whole new realm of our being if we really engage it fully. 
And by accessing those deeper realms, we, it's sort of a wild frontier of our evolution, right? What will I find? Where will I go? What worlds will open up? Thinking suddenly of that um, movie, The Power of Ten, it's a short video, maybe some of you have seen it, where it starts with this uh, freckle on this man's uh, hand he's at a picnic with his sweetheart and then it goes out into from the freckle out into the cosmos and you go you just just you know cosmos after you know our our galaxy beyond galaxy 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 and then they zoom back in and they go inside the freckle and into his inner being and suddenly we're inside you know organs and tissues and cells and then we and suddenly it looks like the starry sky again and so it's just this beautiful access that we can enter into and get lost in really but lost in a good way you know <laughs> like in that that sort of oh like the wonder of a child kind of way where we open up whole new levels of who we are and what we can be and begin to tap at that and allow that divine potential to come forward think about the cultural heroines and heroes of our you know of, of our world like dorothy you know entering oz for example or harry potter entering the school of uh, at hogwarts for witchcraft and wizardry you know it's that kind of experience really like us they spiritually awaken and they evolve by stepping into this wondrous magical world beyond and they access it from within so where exactly is that access point? The more sort of pragmatic folks will ask, you know. Well, Dorothy, you know, named it, you know, home, right? I wanted, Her whole thing was about going home. And so home for a lot of us might be the heart. It might be something different for you where you feel at home, where you feel connected, where you feel that sense of presence. Perhaps when you go within and you close your eyes, it's that place you drop into. So, you know, when we do find that access place, we begin to journey then, right, into this sort of magical world or down the yellow brick road, if you will. Now, some of you might be saying, yeah, that doesn't sound very practical, you know, but hang on, because this is, this is practical spirituality. That's what we even call it. We used to call it practical Christianity, but we've sort of expand how we see ourselves in new thought and often use the term practical spirituality. And life becomes then, in this idea of practical spirituality, a divine dance. And in that divine dance, there is a dance of both the spiritual and the physical world, both the, the inner and the outer experience. So what we learn by going within then becomes our everyday life. It's like the, that idea of the invisible becoming visible. It's experience, the, the words and the movements that come from that, that quiet stillness. Like the still point of the dance, T.S. Eliot talks about, it's that pause and then the dance, then the movement. But they're both part of the dance. So it, when, when we do this, so much more of us becomes available to us. So much more of us, the truth of us, the best part of us, gets unveiled and becomes available and accessible. The divine becomes available and accessible to us moment by moment because we are practiced. We know we, a little bit about what it feels like, what it looks like, what it sounds like. We'll unpack that a little more in a moment. You think about the, the, that time apart, that does feel to me to be key. I know I've heard people say, well, I just pray without ceasing. I pray all day long, you know, just by doing life. And uh, there's some truth to that. And I don't know, personally, I find that I have to also have the time apart to sort of unplug from everything. We're all different. But that time apart also seemed to be key for some pretty big spiritual giants like Jesus, Buddha, Mohammed, Moses, they all had time apart. They all took time for prayer and meditation, whether it was in a cave or under a tree or in the desert. It doesn't really matter where, it's just whatever works for us, right? But by doing so, then they could act from a higher place of self-expression and find a, a clearer purpose for their everyday lives. One of the great gifts of these spiritual leaders and our fictional friends, Dorothy and Harry, 
are that that what we get from this experience is is a access to that divine wisdom within us, that divine guidance through our intuition, right? And so how does your intuition show up? Because it can show up in different ways and some of us might tend to, to be predominantly one way or another way. So it kind of helps to know, oh yeah, how do I get information? How do I access my guidance? How do I tap that wisdom and then know what to do or to say or where to go or what's next in my life? So there are people who are especially honed in intuition who will say that there's predominantly four what they call clairs, which just means clear, essentially. There's the first one is often called clairvoyant, and it's about vision, right? It's about the ability to see, the inner seeing. So it might be visions, it might be dreams, it may be symbols, um, things like that. That It's sort of like dreams uh, in terms of meditation time, like the dream world opens up in a conscious way is maybe one way we could think of inner seeing or clairvoyance. Hearing clair audio, that's when you hear words, right? For me personally, this, this is often how I receive um, divine guidance. And, it, and it's, it's my voice, but it's more authoritative than my voice. And often speaks in pithy statements so, and, and sort of commanding too. It'll be like, you know, go over there, <laughs> say that, <laughs> you know? um, take off your shoes, you know, it will be sort of like that, or it will be very loving. There might come as a very loving, like, um, you are so loved, or rest, and it'll just come with that sort of love and compassion kind of thing. Still, though, kind of has that authoritative sort of do it <laughs> you know, feeling. That's how it works for me. But maybe that's, this is one of yours. Maybe clairaudience or inner hearing is one of the ways that you experience your guidance. And, or maybe you will um, now that you're paying more attention to it. The, the third one is feeling. It's called clairsentience. And, and feeling is, um, it can come through bodily sensations. So, you know, when we say we have God bumps, a lot of us will experience that. Oh my gosh, I have God, God bumps, you know, that's that sense, or goosebumps, uh, that's that sense of there's, there's a, a feeling in the air, right? Or I have a gut feeling. A lot of us can relate to that. I have a gut feeling. Most of us also can relate to the idea that you walk into a room or a house and there's a certain energy that you feel, right? Or you're around a person or a group of people and you can really feel a certain kind of energy. I know sometimes I've turned, I've gone into those big box stores, especially the electronic ones like Best Buy, and I've turned right back around and got in my car because the energy is just too overwhelming, all that technology and electromagnetic energy. So, so those are the kinds of experiences that we can be, become aware of through clairsentience or feeling. And then there's knowing, clair, claircognizance it's called. And claircognizance is, is sort of like an information download, you know, it's a, or a divine idea that comes to you or an immediate solution to a problem. This might be what my grandmother was talking about when she told me when I was very young about this day that she was trying to work out these, they were, ma she called them math problems probably so I could relate to it, but basically I think it was her finances and she was, had been working and working all day and trying to figure it all out and, and she just got kind of hung up and, and flummoxed by it and couldn't figure it out, but it was in the quiet of, of lying down in her bed at night and, and just being still that suddenly she saw like the whole page and all the answers. That's an example of, of instant knowing, of, of clairsentience. So uh, um, often, I'll too, just a, a little extra thing that, that they often say is claircognizance and, clair, um, and um, the feeling one, uh, clairsentience, can often work together. Much like feelings and thoughts, right? As we talked about last week in the co-creative principle, or heart and mind dance together. So let's just take a look at those for a moment because that was a lot to take in so you can just have sort of a snapshot of it. So these are the four primary ways that we might access divine guidance. Inner seeing, inner hearing, inner feeling, and inner knowing. These gifts 
are not reserved only for people we might call intuitive, empathic, psychic, whatever names that we might use. They are available to all of us. We all have divine potential and we all have innate wisdom and we all have means to access these. A great way to hone these, sort of the golden key that opens the door, prayer and meditation. I'm pretty sure you filled in that sense. <laughs> if you remember nothing else from this message on our fourth principle, we will summon the goddess Nike now to give you three words. Just do it. That's it, right? <laughs> and then you can see, how does, pra how does it work for you? How does it manifest in your life? How does it show up for you? And you'll want more of that as you do. It's a bit like exercising, you know? We exercise, our bodies feel great, we feel energized, we're looking good, we're feeling good. And then somehow, I don't know, we just get out of the habit. We start eating junk food and watching, you know, binging on TV. And then all of a sudden we're just, you know, we don't feel very good. And then, we, oh yeah, that's right, exercise. Spiritual practice can be something like that, that simple. And of course, so much more rich in terms of what it can offer us in these access to these deep, deep realms. So I think if you engage in practice, I will bet that you will experience something like your life becomes more interesting, more mysterious, more joyful, more meaningful, maybe all of these. I don't know, or maybe you'll fill in something else, a sense of vibrancy and aliveness. Let's practice. Let's try it <laughs> and see how we access these inner realms, these deeper realms. And let's make our li of our lives a flowing dance with spirit, going within, allowing the words and the actions and the motions to, to, to be that outplay of the divine in the world. And then a moment to pause and then to move. That's, that's the beauty of, of the relationship with the divine that prayer and meditation can offer us, deepening. So let's know this together. Let's affirm it. Let's work it together and practice this week. Please join me in this affirmation. Through the practice of prayer and meditation, I access deeper realms of innate wisdom and my life becomes a flowing dance with the divine. God bless you.